3D Maker Pro sent over the mole 3D scanner for me to review and I was dumb enough to say yes and that I'll do it before Black Friday. So with limited time, how can I do a review that actually makes sense? Well, we have to be a little bit creative. And you will have to subscribe for more content where you use this scanner more and even versus other scanners, so like a one versus one. So I've been using professional 3D scanners for over 10 years, so I'm fairly familiar with what makes a 3D scanner good or bad. But are you? I don't think this review can relay my knowledge on all aspects of 3D scanning, but let's try to talk about expectations and how well the mole meets those expectations. The reality is that the 3D scanner is often presented as a hardware unit with hardware specifications, so like megapixels, uh, optics, sensor size, yeah, all of that good stuff. Yes, the hardware dictates the capabilities of each 3D scanner using these sensor sizes and, and megapixels. But that's just one side of it. It is the software and how it deals with those numbers and specifications that is interesting and well worth trying to review for. So how good is the software 3D Maker Pro Mole 3D Scanner? I'm glad you asked. As you saw inside the box of this premium version, we get the nice motorized turntable, power cable, tripod, extra tripod extension, and of course the scanner itself. But we don't get any software, so we have to download that ourselves. We do that from 3D Maker Pro's website. At first glance, you do get a few tips and tricks during the startup. You get a little bit of a guide on how to think with shiny and dark surfaces and how important it is to set your exposure correctly. I think the user interface is actually quite nice. It's fairly easy to understand it, and it has all the tools available at all time. Again, what makes a good 3D scanning software is how well it lets you capture things and maybe more importantly how it lets you process those scans in both good and bad situations. And to my surprise, the James Studio is actually quite good, but not perfect. <laughs> so let me show you. The way you 3D scan is either by using the handheld mode, which is moving the scan around, or using the turntable with the scanner facing the turntable. There is a preview window to let you see both how the mesh is gonna look and how the exposure is set. And this exposure is crucial to perfect. If you over or underexpose, the projected light is not going to be perfectly captured by the sensors or the cameras, and therefore you won't get a good surface registered. You also have an indicator on your left side of the screen that helps you understand at what range are you capturing data, are you within the, are you within the tolerances of scanning range. Here it's quite clear that this is a scanner made for fairly small objects. With, with its fairly small scanning volume or scanning area of 100 by 200 millimeters, it's important to always keep something trackable within that area, which can be a bit tricky on larger objects like this downhill handle, for example. If you don't have enough features, like different geometries to track on, this scanner is going to lose tracking because it doesn't have the sticky markers that you can put on some other scanners, which is usually a good thing that it doesn't require those but it means that you can lose tracking. And luckily, this scanner is actually very good on picking up lost tracking. So when you lose tracking, uh, you just retrace your steps a little bit back and usually it just kicks in and it continues where it left off. Sometimes you may get a little bit of like overlap or a different angle uh, continuing scanning when you see it should be a flat angle or it's slightly off. Usually when you process the data, it will kind of figure that out. So don't throw your data away just because you see something a little bit weird in the preview. So when you're done with the scan, you can just click spacebar and it will stop the scan process for a little bit. And what it's doing there is that it's taking all these scanned images and trying to align them over each other. So this is one of the major steps with handle 3D scanning that is processed in data in like sequential and hopefully in, in general order as well. So it takes frame two, applies it to frame one, trying to align three to two, four to three, and so on. It's unclear if this scanner also tries to do everything in sequence. So if you scan around something, does it try to match the last to the first frame or is it just in order? Difficult to say, but it's nice because when you have done a scan, it's very quickly to just keep adding scans. So for example, if you are starting to reach the limit of the power cable, maybe you're in a awkward angle, you can just stop the scan, let it process, reorientate model and, and get back to it. 
it's a great workflow if you're doing a larger piece and it's difficult to capture everything at once and you want to maybe make sure that you're actually capturing things um, then it's a good way to pause keep adding scans because you can align those quite easily in the software i'll, I'll show you later so when you're processing the scans you get this non-linear workflow um, that lets you scan of course review scans and new scans uh, align those scans or remove bad scans before you process the data into a mesh file or what they call fusion but in this process you can also go back and add scans so if you're not happy with a fusion you can just delete that go back align again maybe add another scan and keep retrying with the same like raw data this is a great workflow actually and it's seen in top of the line scanners like Arctic 3d that are like 50 times more expensive than this one it really lets the user adapt for what they are experiencing. So if you're going to 3D scanning, expecting to do it in the first run, maybe you won't, but then you can just keep adding scans. And it's a super easy way to approach it. It's not as foolproof as like a stationary, only stationary 3D scanner might be, where it's like click scan and it will do everything for you. You have to do a little bit more here, so it's not perfectly foolproof. So although this is a great workflow on paper, I'm actually missing a few important features that I think is required for 3D scanning. So here there's clear improvements. One of those features is that you really want to cover as much as possible with the scanner. Uh, there's no really good hole filling except for the automated one which fills all the holes but there's no option to like pick the small ones, only fill up to a certain size, maybe avoid the biggest two holes because usually in the professional workflow uh, filling holes is reducing data quality because you're faking the data. Sometimes it's better to fill those holes in different algorithms depending on what type of hole it is. Sometimes you just want to remodel it yourself. But for a beginner, I think this is an okay workflow because you're maybe expecting to get the perfectly solid model that you can print directly, maybe. But it's a lacking feature. And when you have processed a scan and you had the final mesh, there's like no way to repair things. I'm editing until here. Apparently you can do edit from edit menu and repair. And as you can see, it kind of fixes the things. This processing you can do in other free software. So I mean, it's not the biggest hurdle. It's just, it's also worth noticing that the turntable mode is not like a separate algorithm. Not as far as I can see. It's only a way to help you move the scanner around the objects by moving the objects. So it's not like rotational angles measured from the turntable to make sure that the alignment is extra exact, nothing like that that you see in some more expensive scanners. It's just a way to rotate the object for you. And yeah, speaking of the turntable, to my surprise, mine stopped working or it's working, but it's rotating slower. So that means that the scanner has like this preset. The scanner knows that it should rotate 360 degrees in like 300 frames. So it's scanning 320 frames to get some overlap. But the problem is that now, for some reason, my motor is spinning slower in the turntable. So I'm not getting a full rotation. And there's no way to adjust like how many frames the scanner should take in a rotation. So all my scans are like 290, maybe 320 degrees, not actually 360 or 360 plus. That's a weird stuff. I talked to support about it. I tried different power supplies. I'm not sure what happened. So now comes the fun part of actually doing scanning. Uh, this is where I want to set some expectations. Some of you may buy this 3D scanner to do full copies of objects, uh, like toys, for example, or figurines. So let's see how well it does that. And just a tip here, usually I want to raise the model up so the processing is a bit easier. So let me show you using a turntable scan mode. So the first thing we do is that we initiate, which registers the turntable so we can select it easier. Then we are ready to scan. And you can see I put my object on some sort of distance so it's easier to remove the bottom plate later. I have already set the brightness and exposure so you can see it's okay. We click scan and we, yeah, capture data. And it spins it around. And you can see I'm using texture scan mode because some of you will ask about it. It doesn't have texture mode, but it also has texture mode. <laughs> Let me show you. When it's done, it's rebuilding the frames that it has scanned. So it's sequencing them. And then you can see it's already selected the turntable for us. So we can just click delete and register any other surfaces that we need to remove. Uh, I also had a scan before that didn't use the texture. Don't mind that. Okay, then we're scanning the next angle. And let's speed it up. Again, the turntable is selected for us, so we can just remove that and remove some other surfaces. Now I want to try to get another angle. So I'm gonna turn the mountain around and scan a little bit more from an angle. So get some more angles, capture deeper into crevasses and stuff. 
Here you can see that it selected the turntable, but not enough of my distance. So let's remove that. I'm also going to remove some of the model closest to the turntable, just to make sure the texture and everything is good. So you don't get contamination. Then we click align on everything. It should be able to do auto alignment here. It's a little bit sped up, but that works very well. So you can see all the parts have aligned. Now it's time to fusion, so we click on repair, remove noise. And we're also going to simplify because we're using texture. Uh, let's do a normal processing. And as you can see, we have texture, but it's black and white. The orange is where it's trying to repair the texture and obviously did not do a good job. But anyways, the mesh itself looks actually really, really good. So let's save that and check out the texture. It's uh, kind of worthless, but you can use it for some application, but it's not the mapped texture. So I wanted to show you this tool where after you have meshed the model, you can actually edit it a little bit. Um, in the intro, I didn't know about this feature, but now I do. So I'm selecting the areas that I want gone because this is a Brio train track and <laughs> there should be a hole here. So I've just deleted the things and I mean, it's not pretty, but I have deleted things that look worse. And now if we go up here and we click repair again through another menu, it kind of does the job for us. I mean, it's not pretty, but it works for some stuff. You can also align your model when you're done. So if you want to 3D print this directly, I would suggest to cut the, the floor before printing this one. But we can set our three points to create a, a flat plane and then adjust our model on that plane. That's very nice and it's very handy to send your model out before, uh, yeah, to do whatever you want. So that's the full process. Okay, now we saw that. Can we scan something bigger? Um, well, the specifications say up to 150 centimeters. I don't think that's cubic, but rather like an area of 150 centimeters. I'm not sure if it's a square area or just like a distance. Um, well, not too big actually. And again, the object that you're scanning has to be kind of optimal. So you need the geometry because you can't add these stickers. So you need like the 100 by 200 millimeter area of features. So if you're scanning a wall, there's not a lot of unique features, so you can't really scan that with this scanner. So taking the downhill helmet, for example, if we imagine this 100 by 200 millimeter, it's on the limit. Um, you can kind of see that behind the paper, there's always some geometry. So we should be able to track it quite well. However, it's also very black and very white. So how are we going to expose for that? Well, we can't. <laughs> so we have to kind of make do. I could spray all the black surfaces with the scanning spray but I actually didn't want to do that. Uh, so we're just gonna focus on what I'm able to scan in the dark area. So please keep that in mind that I did not prepare this object optimally. I just wanted to scan the dark area. Starting with the handheld mode, you can see we are scanning, we're detecting surfaces, we're building up, but sometimes you actually slip up a little bit. If you just move back, it will grab that alignment again and we can continue scanning. That's actually quite nice. So trying to cover as much as possible, staying inside the range. You can see I'm, I'm messing up a little bit, but it's not too bad actually. So now I'm lost again, trying to recoup the position, going back. You can see in the preview, there we go. Now I'm, I'm sticking it again. So we continue scanning. I think that's a pretty good view. We're probably gonna close it off very soon because I can kind of feel that we are missing some alignment here. But that doesn't matter. That's the first one processed. Let's go to the second angle and second scan. So again, you can see I'm struggling a little bit with alignment somewhere or the tracking, but it usually detects that very well and it's just, you can just step back and, and uh, recover your steps. And there we go. Um, yeah, of course we have to align them. We can do that automatically. And I think it should do an okay job. Let's see. It does, but can you see the chin guard? Ah, oh, something is messed up. So something happened during scanning, which meant that the tracking didn't really work on the purple or the mango part. So I'm gonna delete that area, and that's actually okay, because we don't need that area itself. We can do a third scan, trying to cover all of those areas in the front where the shin guard is. I'm actually gonna remove a little bit more, because I see there are some errors in some sectors here. So there we go, now the raw data looks good. It's still not processed, this is just in the scan data. So I'm gonna add the third scan, Trying to get some data back there to cover, and you can see we now have the front there as well. Aligning all of these doesn't work automatically, so we have to do it manually. 
So we'll go over to the manual, select which one to reference, and all you have to do is click these three points at the same area of two scans. So you can see we are selecting different parts of the scan. So in this case, the left side is the reference, I think. Maybe it's the right side, I always forget. And then when we align, things are looking very good. And then we should be able to process this scan. So we process all of them in quite low refinement because why not? We'll, we'll try higher later. And yeah, maybe I should not try to fill the holes because that's way too little data to fill the holes, but hey, it, it actually tried it pretty well. So let's do it again. Let's just hide that scan process without filling the holes. I'm actually gonna simplify this model a little bit just to make it look pretty. So now it's a simplified model, but we can also do a high res model. So now I'm doing a high refinement, no simplification, and you should see more details, but of course much more noise. But depending on what you're looking for, this might be a scanning mode that you want to do. So that looks absolutely okay. Uh, it's workable. I wouldn't scan much larger objects, at least not 360 of them. But are we getting 0 0.05 millimeter accuracy and 0.1 millimeter resolution? Well, no, not in the sense that you're thinking. Let me demonstrate by scanning this 123 machined block. This is used as a reference in many machining applications because it's quite precisely manufactured. And if we scan it, you, we should be able to compare it and see how much we are off using the 3D scanner. I'm obviously using a scanning spray to make this matte. It's not matte anymore because this disappears after a while. <laughs> so it's shiny now when I'm filming again. And to be fair, I will only do one rotation of scanning. So we're not gonna measure offset in, in, in Z axis, only like on the flat surfaces towards the original CAD object. Because we have grooves, we have threads, we're not gonna measure deviation or anything of that. I just want the outer dimensions. Like is this two inches wide, one inch thick? And we're gonna check those measurements. So when I use this software, you can kind of see that when we're comparing the scan to a perfectly CAD model, it's not perfect. Uh, we have some deviations. Remember, we're only measuring in width and thickness, not in total length. So ignore those errors. But you can see that it has like this tapered shape. That's probably due to alignment and the processing. And we're off by a bit, a bit more than 0 0.05 millimeters. And we're off by more than 0.1 millimeter in most of the meshing areas. But looking at the offset, you can see it's mostly in the sharp corners. It's along the edges further away from the rotation. Yeah, it's important to know that you're not getting 0 0.05 millimeter accuracy typical objects or at all. But as you can see, it's not a metrology grade 3D scanner, which they are not really marketing themselves for either, but I'm just wanting you to set your expectations correctly. It's not 0 0.05 millimeter accuracy. So I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying that it's as good as it could sound like when you look at the marketing. So let's try to translate those values to a real like edge case scenario. So this is a professionally CNC milled part in aluminium that I have actually designed that's it's being sold in custom ski stores. This part is within the specification of size, which means 30 millimeters long. Uh, so one would think that we can 3D scan this and we can have 0 0.05 millimeter accuracy. We can have 0.1 millimeter mesh resolution. That's not really the case and let me show you how it looks. So even the scan itself is not great. Uh, we're not getting a ton of raw data to actually work with, but the things that we get is, for some cases, okay, it's not gonna make a copy of this. So for example, if you have Warhammer figurines, it's not gonna make a copy of those Warhammer figurines, I'm sorry. But when we try to actually measure the offset, the data towards the original one, uh, you can see we have some areas where it's fairly okay. It's not the, like the quality where we could do reverse engineering on it. So yeah, for a hobbyist reverse engineer, maybe you're not getting really what you're expecting when you read those values. So let's try to be a hobbyist reverse engineer. Um, let's see if we can scan my regular bike helmet that is much more uniform. And let's scan an area of it and see if we can have good enough data that we can try to model stuff that fits on it. And this is probably where this scanner shines, creating a reference of partial object that you can then use for building stuff yourself. So if you have a bike helmet you want a light holder to, that's a good scanner for that. Maybe you need to attach something in your car on the dashboard. You don't need a full scan of the dashboard or like a fully complete whole field scan. You need the references 
like size and, and angles and stuff like that. The scan of the bike helmets is good. I can use that for stuff. I'm not gonna bore you with 3D modeling. Uh, we'll maybe do that in another video. All right, so review conclusion. As with most 3D scanners in this budget segment, it's not really what you expect. It's not bad at all. The gap between marketing and what you actually get is maybe a bit too far and will risk getting some customers a bit annoyed because they think that they're getting 0.05 millimeter scanning on everything, which they're obviously not. But for those that understands the limit of 3D scanning and what you're actually going to use it for, I think it's a great scanner for those. Again, it's what you expect from a scanner. And with stuff like incredible scan success rates, optical anti-shake modules and visual tracking algorithms ensure you could complete accurate model with every scan. Uh, no bullshit. <laughs> Sorry, but it's still a really good tracking system, but it's not like foolproof. You're not getting a perfect scan every time. Black objects, no problem. Well, sure, almost. Increasing intensity really does uh, let you capture black objects quite well, but at the cost of some noise. Uh, again, it's very difficult to scan both bright and dark objects in one scene, so yes, it does black objects actually very well. 0.05 millimeter accuracy and 0.1 millimeter resolution. Well, yes, technically in a lab using one frame in optimal scanning distance scenario and all that, but also not repeatable. Like in the real world, no. Now to the more positive. Handheld 3D scanners are not trivial. It's actually incredible fast and easy way to capture real objects and digitize them um, as a reference or in some case even a full copy. You could do it cheaper than this in some cases if you spend a lot of time learning photogrammetry for examples. It's possible if you really invest your time in it. But 3D scanning with the mole is not difficult. It's actually very easy as long as you set your expectations. What do you need? Capture the surface as a reference, boom, shoot at it. it like set an exposure and you're ready to go. It's really fast scanning. You don't calibrate the scanner, which is quite weird. Um, there's no calibration plate, I think, included. I haven't found one, unless the table is one. Um, so it's very fast to get going. Just plug it in, shoot, and you're, you have a surface. But you won't get a perfect copy most of the times, so if any, any time. But you're getting great references at a budget price with handle capabilities and even turntable, and you get a lot included in the package. The working area is actually quite great for the like the most applications we with a normal 3D scanner are doing. For like even higher professional grade, you might want to, of course have a bigger working area with the same detail. But yeah, I'm not trying to sell you this scanner. Uh, 3D Maker Pro are. If you have a good understanding of what this is capable of, if you have set your expectations correctly, this will be a great scanner for you. But if you haven't, I'm afraid you will be a little bit disappointed. But that goes for everything. So it's good that you're watching this video doing research because I don't want you to think that everything you scan is gonna be perfectly small items because the specifications say small numbers. And for you, who understands the capabilities of these scanners and have set your expectations accordingly, there's affiliate links down below if you want to buy it. <laughs> so yeah, ask me anything you want about 3D scanning and specifically the mole. I'll be here all day, <laughs> all night. Just ask me down in the comments. Make sure you subscribe because we have more scanners. We're going to do more stuff with this one. And I'm going to teach you even more about 3D scanning because I love that topic. I really love 3D scanning. Thanks for watching. <laughs> I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.